Welcome to the Silica Exposure Training for the Cutstone Industry. This training covers the identification, evaluation, and control of silica exposures in cut stone and stone fabrication industries. The training was developed by Georgia Tech Safety, Health, and Environmental Services Group with funding from the U.S. Department of Labor's Susan Harwood Training Grant Program. This is Lesson 4, the OSHA Silica Standard for General Industry. Understanding what the requirements are if you're in charge of handling compliance with a silica standard can be daunting. There are several regulatory standards that are applicable with relation to documenting compliance. Parts of the puzzle include determining what the exposures are for employees to silica by performing exposure assessments, figuring out if respiratory protection is required, enrolling employees exposed to silica dust above the action level in medical surveillance, performing hazard communication training based on the safety data sheets and exposures for employees, and developing a written exposure control plan. Phew, that may seem like a lot, but let's break it down. Let's review the general industry OSHA silica standard, known as 29 CFR 1910, 1053. The OSHA standard for crystalline silica has two limits. The first limit is called the action level. This means that if employees are exposed to levels of silica dust that are 25 micrograms per cubic meter or higher, the employer needs to take action and implement medical surveillance for employees, provide training about silica, and develop an exposure control plan. The second level is called the permissible exposure limit. This is the limit that is considered the highest level that employees should ever be exposed to during a full shift. For silica, this limit is 50 micrograms per cubic meter. To give you an example of what amount of silica dust we are talking about, take a look at this penny and then take a look at the small amount of silica dust next to the penny. The pile of silica dust represents the levels we are talking about, which is very small amount. Under the silica standard, employers must meet certain requirements. Employers must determine exposure to respirable crystalline silica, determine regulated areas, and also create a written exposure control plan for their facility. Employers are also responsible for implementing a respiratory protection program if necessary providing employees with medical surveillance and providing employees with training related to the hazards associated with respirable crystalline silica exposure. The first step towards gaining compliance with the silica standard is to conduct exposure monitoring. There are two options for determining the exposure. One is called the performance option, where you look at a combination of air monitoring data that was collected and make a judgment about exposure or you can do what we call perform scheduled monitoring or representative sampling, which is where you conduct air sampling for the employees at the facility to see their exposures. This is actually the best method for cut stone companies because each company processes such a wide variety of types of stone. They have very different buildings and ventilation where the fabrication takes place and use different tools. For these three reasons, Using someone else's data may not actually represent the levels of silica in the air at your facility. Depending on the results, if silica is measured to be below all the OSHA limits for silica, then no further testing is required. If the results are between the action level and the permissible exposure limit, the company will need to retest every six months. And if the results are above the permissible exposure limit, the company has to perform silica sampling every three months. First, let's take a look at what silica sampling looks like. Then we will look at some objective data that could be used for the performance option. In this video, an industrial hygienist, which is a scientist that assesses employee exposure to hazards, is explaining to a polisher that she will be performing air sampling to determine his exposure to silica. To monitor for silica, you use a pump, which works like a vacuum cleaner, to pull air into this device we call a cyclone. The cyclone spins the air around, so only the smallest particles that can get into your lungs land on the filter. 
Then, at the end of the day, the filter will be sent to a lab that will measure what landed on the filter. After the lab analyzes the filter, they will send the company the results, which will help them to determine if they need to implement additional engineering controls or if employees need to wear respiratory protection. Now, let's review some objective data that consultants at the Georgia Tech OSHA Consultation Program collected from 2017 to 2021. We reviewed this information during Lesson 2, but now let's look at it from the perspective of complying with the OSHA Silica Standard. During this time, they assisted eight different companies that fabricate cut stone for the countertop industry. A total of 10 visits were conducted where monitoring was conducted for employees' exposure to silica dust, collecting a total of 46 full shift samples at these sites. Employees were fabricating a wide range of countertops, including engineered stone or quartz countertops. For almost all shops, the type of stone being fabricated varied day to day based on orders. However, the average amount of silica that employees were exposed to averaged 227 micrograms per cubic meter. This is 4.5 times the OSHA permissible exposure limit and over nine times the action level for silica. When no controls were in place and employees were cutting, polishing, or performing other types of fabrication dry, the exposures were 34 to 46 times the permissible exposure limit and ranged from 1,700 to 2,300 micrograms per cubic meter. However, even when companies implemented some form of engineering controls by using either wet methods, ventilation, or both wet methods and ventilation, the exposures were still two times the permissible exposure limit and ranged from 9.6 to 370 micrograms per cubic meter. In fact, 86% of all samples exceeded the OSHA action level of 25 micrograms per cubic meter for silica. What this means is that water and ventilation alone did not reduce exposures below the action level or permissible exposure limit when countertops were being fabricated due to the high silica content in engineered stone or quartz countertops. Technically, respiratory protection is required if measured exposures to silica are greater than the OSHA permissible exposure limit, even after engineering and work practice controls are installed. And if exposures are greater than the permissible exposure limit during maintenance and repair tasks where engineering and work practice controls aren't feasible. When all controls are implemented and exposures still aren't less than the permissible exposure limit, or while employees are in regulated areas. That said, based on the data we just shared, if engineered stone is being processed, we recommend employees be provided with at least an N95 respirator. In these photos, you see that one employee is wearing a half mask elastomeric respirator with combination cartridges to protect from dust and chemicals. In the second picture, the employee is wearing an N95 respirator, but has not securely placed the lower strap behind his neck yet. Exposure monitoring results are also used to determine which areas in the facility will be designated as regulated ones. Before entering these areas, there should be signs to alert employees about the exposure hazards and prompt employees to wear the appropriate respiratory protection. The sign must state, Danger, respirable crystalline silica, may cause cancer, causes damage to the lungs, wear respiratory protection in this area, authorized personnel only. Medical surveillance is required when employees are exposed to respirable crystalline silica for 30 days or more a year above the action level. The initial or baseline exam must be made available within 30 days of their initial assignment, unless the employee has received an equivalent medical exam within the past three years. And then, periodic examinations must be made available every three years. The employer must not allow dry sweeping, 
dry brushing, and no use of compressed air, unless that compressed air is used in conjunction with a ventilation system, or there is absolutely no other method available. Wet sweeping and the use of HEPA filtered vacuum systems are the main ways to manage dust. To make sure employees are aware of all the aspects of the silica standard, there are two main ways the employer has to communicate this information. The first is by developing a written exposure control plan, and the second is by conducting training. The written exposure control plan is similar to a job hazard analysis in that the employer is required to describe every task where employees are exposed to silica dust. Then after describing the task, the employer must list the controls that were implemented to reduce exposure to silica dust. This might include engineering controls, work practice controls, and respiratory protection. Then, the employer will explain how employees can safely perform housekeeping and prevent employees not authorized from entering the work area and walking through the production floor. We recommend checking out the OSHA Small Entity Compliance Guide for instructions on creating the written exposure control plan, found on the OSHA website at OSHA.gov. It includes a helpful sample document. Or check out the Silica Safe website, where they have a create a plan tool that walks you through the process. One of the most important parts of the silica standard is the requirement to provide hazard communication training to employees to let them know the hazards of working with silica. Let's hear from Ever to find out what kind of training he had received. Okay. Este, nunca eh, recibí entrenamiento ni en inglés ni en español. O sea, ningún entrenamiento. Solamente entramos a trabajar y nadie dijo nada. From Ever's video, you can understand how angry he became after finding out after years of being exposed to silica that it was dangerous. Employees may even be at significant risk even if they are not exposed to high levels of respirable crystalline silica. Employers are required to provide training on the hazards associated with exposure to respirable crystalline silica as part of their hazard communication program. The employer must also provide labels on containers and slabs of stone of crystalline silica, maintain a copy of safety data sheets, and train employees about the silica standard and potential health effects, which include cancer, lung effects, immune system effects, and kidney effects. Finally, let's talk record keeping. To comply with the silica standard, Fit test records for respiratory protection must be maintained until the next test or for one year. Exposure records or air sampling results must be saved for 30 years with detailed information about who was sampled, what tools they were using, the conditions of the work environment the day the sampling was performed and the materials being processed. And finally, medical evaluation and respiratory protection and surveillance records for silica sampling must be retained for at least the duration of employment plus 30 years. These records must also be made available to employees or to their designated representatives. Thank you for watching lesson four of the silica exposure training for the cutstone industry a training on the identification, evaluation, and control of silica exposure in the cut stone and stone fabrication industries. This material was produced under grant number SH37200, SH1, from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, U.S. Department of Labor. It does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of the U.S. Department of Labor, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial products, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government.